Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this afternoon's session on using freshwater mussel research in scientific engagement from citizen science to the classroom. My name is Joe Lattimore. I am an aquatic ecologist based at Michigan State University, and uh, I'm excited to be part of Wisconsin Water Week. I'll be serving as this session's moderator, and um, would like to remind you that you can always type questions for our presenters in the Q&A tab um, in Event Mobi. Um, anything you put in the chat, we probably won't see. So if you have questions, get them into the Q&A. Um, appreciate that. And I'm really looking forward to this um, interesting and interactive session they have planned for you. So I'm just going to hand it right over to the presenters now and let them take it away. All right. So my name's James, and I'll be talking a little bit later as well. But we're going to start this out as people are kind of filing in here with a Kahoot quiz on what you think muscle names should be called. So for those of you who haven't used Kahoot uh, before, it's a really good engagement tool, especially in the digital uh, range. So uh, age, that's the word I'm looking for. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to any device that can connect to the internet, phone, tablet, iPad. You can use it on your computer and just have another screen. Um, you just want to go to the web browser and type in kahoot.it, which is right here. And it will ask you for a game pin. The game pin you'll enter is 5235076. That will be up later as well. And then it'll ask you for a username that you want to use, the seen as. And as we go through the presentation, you'll be able to answer a couple of questions here and there and see if you get uh, some of these uh, muscle names correct. So this is the first session. So up here at the top, you can see we have the game pin again and kind of some information on what to do. We already have three people in here, which is good. And when we start it, we're also going to have the game pin down here in the bottom corner. So if you haven't quite gotten logged in yet, you can still join at any point in the game and the game pin will always be down in this bottom corner. All right, well with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start it and get the first couple of questions going nice and slow and people feel, and feel free to join in as you can. So this is the muscle name game. And you'll have, you have 20 seconds and the answers are going to be on this screen, the shared screen, but you need to click it on your device. And right down here in the corner is the information you want to go, if you're just joining us, go to kahoot.it and enter the game pin 5235076. All right, and here are your answers. Let's see how people did. All right, three had a correct answer. So we can see that Cody is in the lead for correct answers, which is pretty fun, uh, but he's biased. You'll, you'll meet him later. All right, name this muscle. This one's a fun one. Now, this one is kind of interesting, but a big thing about it is the textures that you can see over here. So try to look over here and base the name off of what you see on this side. Three Ridge, all right. Almost half of, half of you got it correct. That's good. All right. And Muscle Man jumps into the lead. And this will be the last one for the intro section. And then we're going to segue into our first part of the talk. So name this muscle. It's a pretty fun name. That's all I got to say. I mean, look at all the options. It's great. OK. And here we go. OK. Yeah, about a 50-50 split. OK, so now we're going to switch over to Becky, who is going to get our presentation officially started. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Becky Doyle Morin. 
I am a professor and a freshwater ecologist at University of Wisconsin Platteville. Um, and I am here with some really amazing colleagues uh, representing a variety of organizations to tell you about the collaborative work that we have been doing, uh, both to increase the scientific and the societal knowledge of some of our favorite freshwater invertebrates, freshwater mussels. Before we get started, I'd like to provide you with a quick game plan for how our hour and a half session is going to go. First, my amazing UW Platteville students, Emma, James, and Cody, will start with an overview of basic mu muscle biology and ecology and their importance to our ecosystems. Then uh, Jesse will follow by sharing the research he and Lizzie have been doing and the out outreach experiences they've had at um, or with the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, Jared will then discuss his muscle-based engagement through the National M Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. And finally, I'll wrap it up with how our collaborative work is pulling my lab and my students for my classes into the field, um, studying and helping to increase awareness of these awesome organisms. Interspersed throughout, uh, as James just uh, demonstrated for you, we'll have opportunities for questions, uh, which you can add into the Q&A session, and an opportunity for you to continue this Kahoot uh, to quiz your knowledge on common and unique muscle names. And so with that, I'd like to introduce my students, Emma Bryla, James Cahill, and Cody Bell, who are going to provide you with some great background information on the organisms that have brought us all together, the freshwater mussels. Okay, so starting off, we're going to go into a little bit of, like Becky said, the background of what these organisms actually are. So they are aquatic invertebrates. So that means that they're animals without a traditional backbone like you and me. They're in the phylum mollusca. So a couple of relatives that you've probably heard of are snails, clams, and actually octopi distantly. So that's pretty cool. They are bivalves. So that means they just have a hinge shell. Everyone's heard of that. They are filter feeders and we'll dive into that a little bit later. That's a main and very important process that these muscles go through for themselves and for other organisms. So the one thing that's very important is then we want to focus on the native and the beneficial muscles. So as you can see the photo right to the right over here, this big pile of muscles, those are zebra muscles and those you don't want them. They have a cool name, but they're not actually very cool. So they actually permanently attach themselves with bissel threads to either the sediment or to the native muscles themselves. And they actually outcompete those muscles for the nutrients that they need. And so, as I said before, they are related to clams, but they are a little bit different. They kind of get mixed up sometimes. They are similar ecologically. So they kind of do the same things but the main difference is abundance. These clams, especially the invasive clams, as it's shown the Asian clam down on the bottom, they multiply like crazy. And kind of like with the zebra mussels, they outcompete those native mussels for nutrients, for everything that they need. So as I was mentioning before, they have a hinged shell. So that's their hard outer body, kind of like a body of armor of sorts. And they have this because their internal body is actually very soft and needs that outer protection. Some of the main features on the inside, they have a muscular foot as it's like to be called. So over there on the diagram is number seven, that's used for burrowing and locomotion. And as you can see in the picture to the left of the diagram, they have siphons for filtering and feeding. They have an in siphon and an out siphon. Not only do they provide the muscle with nutrients, they actually can, can indicate if the water column is healthy. So if you see a muscle that's super open, that's actually not a great thing. And then they also have gills. So that means they use respiration. They need very highly oxygenated water as well. So muscles have a very unique life cycle. And I'm gonna walk you through it one step at a time. It starts out with a male and a female muscle and the male releases his sperm into the water column. The female, when she's siphoning water in and filtering it, if there's any sperm in there, she pulls it in and fertilizes her eggs with it. Those eggs develop into what are called glochidia. 
The Glaucidia is a semi-parasitic life stage that needs to be uh, attached to uh, fish, fish gills usually, but there are a few species, at least one, that uses salamanders, I believe. So these will attach and they're pushed onto the fish either through just sheer luck of being spurted into the water column or attracted, the fish are attracted to the muscles by lures. They'll attach and grow until they reach juvenile stage, at which point they fall off, fall to the sediment, burrow in, grow, and start all over again. Mussels do have a tendency to form beds, which is large groups of the same and sometimes multiple different species of mussels. So this here is a demonstration, demonstration of a plain pocketbook, which if you go out at the right time of the year here in Wisconsin and go into the river systems, you might see this yourself in the, at the bottom of the rivers, which is pretty cool. As you can see, it just kind of wiggles back and forth and it looks like a fish. So this next one here is a demonstration of a female rele releasing Glacidia just straight into the water column. And this is where they're kind of saying, all right, Glacidia, you're on your own. Go find a fish. And here, we're about to see it. And poof, there's a bunch of Glacidia just being thrown into the water column, which is pretty cool, but I'm a little biased. All right, so as Emma mentioned earlier, they are filter feeders, mussels are filter feeders, and that makes them kind of an unsung hero of our water systems. So by filter feeding, they um, filter out phytoplankton, which is their main food source, but they also filter out floating particles or other suspended particles and toxins and um, other pollutants as they filter, which cleans the water column. Um, this can be kind of related to like a Brita filter like we use in our water. Uh, so, and as you can see up in the top right there, not only do they filter, they feed on phytoplankton, but they're a huge part of several different trophic levels in a uh, aquatic ecosystem. And they're actually a food source for some terrestrial animals such as muskrats and raccoons. So here on this slide, you can uh, see, or this is 24 plain pocketbooks uh, filtering 10 gallons of water over a 90 minute period. And on the right hand side, as, as the time goes on here, you can see how much more clear the water gets compared to the tank on the left. And this is just 24, you know, smaller plain pocketbooks, which an average plain pocketbook can filter up to 10 gallons a day. So think about a bed that's several thousand muscles and how much water they can clean in a day. It's pretty crazy. So unfortunately, however, humans don't have a great history with mussels. Um, and this was brought on by a German Im immigrant named John Beppel, who brought the pearl button industry to the United States, specifically the Mississippi River Basin. So what he did and what a lot of clamors did is what they were called, um, use some really unsustainable methods of collecting clams and mussels. So when I say this, I mean, they took literally everything they possibly could out of the river, it didn't matter what size. And they, if it was big enough to punch a hole in it for a button, they used it. So they decimated populations like crazy all the way up until about the 1930s. And at that point, so much damage was done, they could barely mitigate any of it. Um, fortunately, I guess you could say, karma had its last say um, as John Beppel supposedly died of a blood infection after stepping on a muscle. So mussels have a huge diversity and also a lot of current threats. Cody just touched on the history of the threats to the mussel populations, but unfortunately they're still happening today in our current world. And so in the upper Midwest, there are over 75 species. And you got a little introduction to that with the Kahoot in the beginning. They have some pretty interesting names. And in Wisconsin, there are actually 50 species. And then within those 50 species, 24 are actually state listed. So 24 of those species are in trouble. They're not doing very well. And this can be pinpointed to, you know, not just the three that I have on here, but one of them is human-made structures. So kind of the one that we're focusing on are dams. 
So not only does that deter water flow for the mussels, it also deters the fish population. And as we learned from James, fish are very important in a mussel's life cycle. You know, if they don't have the fish there, they're not gonna be able to reproduce and spread. Some natural threats that impact these mussel populations are erosion. So like right now we're having the spring melt, which yay spring, but that also means that erosion is happening and all that sediment's getting washed into the water. And especially up here, we have a lot in the upper Midwest, we have a lot of runoff from farms and that can really impact the mussels with the chemicals that are being used. And then the big one that we always wanna think about is climate change that is really deterring these mussel populations as well. All right, we're gonna stop talking here. And then if there are any questions that you have right now, um, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, but if not, I'm gonna pass it back over to James. We're gonna do a little bit more of the Kahoot quiz. I'm hoping that you guys can see the Kahoot this time. Uh, we tried something a little bit different, but again, here's the information just right here. Go to kahoot.it on any device with internet, enter this game pin, 5235076, enter the name you want to show up, and play the game. Now, the game, remember to click the buttons on your device. Don't try to click them on the presentation because they don't work. Uh, you can also find the information right down here at the bottom. So without further ado, we'll continue as questions are coming in. So name this muscle. And this one I have a few fun facts on. So this, not necessarily fun facts, but they're facts. This species is invasive and multiplies very quickly. Do, 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 do. All right. Six out of seven got it right. Moving on to the next. So name this muscle. It's a pretty fun, fun one. And I really hope you guys are seeing them this time. All right, four seconds left. All right, yep, five answered correctly. That's good. These are we'll get, we'll get into some more fun names in just in the next section, but they do have some pretty interesting names. This one is a good one though. Name this muscle. And for everybody who knows what this is a reference to, I I hope you enjoy it. Uh, that should give you a hint. That's not the right one. All right, let's see. Yes, that one was called a butterfly because it looks like a butterfly wings. All right, so at this point, we're going to have Jesse share with us the muscle research and outreach work that he and Lissy are doing at the Wisconsin DNR. Okay. Is everybody able to hear me right now? You sound good. You just need to start oh. the slideshow. There you go. Oh, without notes. There you go. There we go. Great. All right. Thanks, James. Um, so we already got a great introduction to the world of freshwater muscle ecology. I'm just gonna to touch on what the state of Wisconsin is doing to help protect this very important resource. Um, so I'm Jesse Weinzinger, I'm a conservation biologist for the DNR. I'm stationed out of Wisconsin Rapids, but I conduct muscle monitoring activities um, and coordinate with partners uh, across the state, uh, along with Lisi. So today we're going to be touching on uh, DNR efforts and volunteer opportunities for muscle monitors. 
Um, as Emma already touched on, um, we have 24 out of 50 species uh, that are state listed throughout Wisconsin. Um, we did have, we previously had 52 documented species. However, two have recently become extinct. Um, and we'll touch on why. So uh, we have very common species. You can find them in local lakes. You can find them in rivers. You can find them in wetlands, streams, uh, even trout waters at points. Um, however, they're very sensitive. So if you, um, Emma already mentioned with runoff potential in the spring and throughout big rain events, you'll have a lot of sedimentation going into the local rivers. Um, and that usually carries nutrients, uh, including ammonia. Uh, it's, uh, ammonia is a byproduct of various nutrients coming into the river system, um, which can impair water quality. So on the right, you'll see this um, SNP out of uh, uh, EPA water quality uh, standards report. And Historically, they did not include mussels, at least into their ammonia water quality standards. But once they started testing for them in 2012, 2013, they realized that mussels out of all taxa groups, whether it be fishes, mayflies, dragonflies, um, eight out of the 10 most sensitive organisms to uh, ammonia concentrations in a river system are, are freshwater mussels. So I, they actually had to improve their water quality standards to help protect uh, various mussel species. Connectivity barriers, Emma also touched on that. So you think of the hydraulics of river systems change above and below dams. You think of climate change um, and how not only thermal temperatures, but you have increasing droughts, you have increasing 100-year, um, 1,000-year floods in some cases uh, that have occurred here in Wisconsin in the last five years. And then you have uh, invasive species. Every, a lot of people know about zebra and quagga mussels, how they can attach to the incurrent siphons on the, mus the native mussel and essentially um, uh, suffocate the animal. And then Asian clams, which were also brought up, and how those can, when they die off, change toxicity levels in the sediment, therefore killing uh, generally very small, uh, young, uh, newly developing mussels. So because of their sensitivities, freshwater mussels are regularly considered through Fish and Wildlife Service, through um, various world organization group, uh, wildlife organization groups, as the most imperiled taxa group in the world. This graph right here shows you um, out of all documented species in North America, almost 70% are imperiled. Uh, so either sp state um, or province uh, special listed as concern, threatened, endangered, or even extinct. Um, in the United States, since the 1970s, we've had over um, 30 freshwater mussels uh, become extinct, including two in the state of Wisconsin. So if you compare them to other taxa groups that get a lot of conservation focus, such as mammals and birds, um, you know, on the orders of magnitude, freshwater mussels can be a lot more imperiled. So we like to consider them as the gold standard in um, uh, conservation. So again, what is Wisconsin doing to try and protect uh, these sensitive organisms? Massively important. Um, Cody mentioned how they filter several gallons of water a day. Uh, there are various species that filter out over 10 gallons of water in a single day. So if you add that to a muscle bed that can comprise of hundreds of thousands of am animals, you benefit or uh, benefits um, from these guys to human health um, are are very significant. So we coordinate with uh, the Natural Resource F Foundation and various nature centers, river groups, volunteer groups to conduct trainings throughout the state. Um, in the non-COVID year, we have all those uh, um, trainings documented on our website. We conduct salvages with local river groups or lake groups. 
um, not only to help protect species as a drawdown is occurring, but also learn what the muscle assemblage is like at a given lake, uh, flowage, or river. Muscle blitzes, we've worked with Oneida Land and Water Con Conservation, Vilas County, um, and uh, Milwaukee River Keepers to conduct uh, basin-wide muscle blitzes to learn what muscles occur in various lakes. Reintroduction efforts, we partnered with the Upper Sugar River Water Watershed Association um, to actual, actually augment uh, a plain pocket book um, population. Um, and as was previously shown in a, one of those short clips of the mussel lure, the plain pocket book develops that min minnow mimic, which uh, uh, you can see if you're snorkeling possibly in the Sugar River. And then we do basin-wide assessments. So where does all this data come, uh, go to? How is it used by resource managers? What happens to the data? So whenever a, a CBM volunteer, nature group, uh, county conservation program um, observes a mussel, They'll send us the data. We captured into the Wisconsin Muscle Monitoring um, Muscle Atlas. So that's where all of this data is housed. Um, and so this map on the right, all these points here are from uh, historical muscle observations that have been documented, captured and documented to the DNR. So these small uh, gray dots are historical records, but it's difficult to cover 15,000 lakes and 84,000 river miles um, throughout the state, especially when two muscle biologists are tasked at trying to cover all those water bodies. So the green dots show where DNR um, efforts and surveys have been conducted in the last five years. But you see, we can't cover all those water bodies. So uh, the blue dots help have helped really significantly uh, gather data on not only water bodies that haven't been surveyed in the last 10 years or five years or 20 years or 50 years, but brand new observations. So you'll see some of these blue points um, where they're either new records or records um, that have not been updated in the last 30 years. So Northern Wisconsin Highlands, a lot of the lake systems, brand new observations of um, mussel beds. Southeast Wisconsin, a lot of uh, partner and volunteer opportunities down there that have contributed information on uh, Wisconsin state listed species even. So that information is then um, captured and then we share any list state and uh, federally listed species with Fish and Wildlife Survey and we can help determine if more conservation practices need to be implemented at local, state, or federal levels through species status assessments and work planning efforts. And then we also share the data, um, observa unique observations with volunteers as part of our uh, Wisconsin Muscle Monitoring Program. So, as mentioned, we have the Muscle Monitoring Program, and the concept behind this, kind of the vision, is to provide a statewide infrastructure that serves as a platform to build projects, programs, tool, and tools for citizen monitors interested in muscle monitoring. The objective is to involve volunteers in finding out what muscles occur, where muscles occur, and what population characteristics um, they may provide throughout the state. So we have this website where you'll see um, all of our muscle information is housed if you type in um, Wisconsin Muscle Monitoring uh, Program through your web browser. We have various guidance documents, monitoring resources, um, guidance on how to submit observations. But one tool I just want to touch on is this observation by county. And that's a, a GIS engine that uh, translocates our database to a viewing uh, platform for your use. So we're gonna learn about muscle efforts going on in Grant County, for instance. So 
Say if you live in Grand County and you want to know what muscles occur in your local river, just find Grand County. You'll find the list of rivers where uh, the muscle atlas has documented muscle occurrence. And say you live on the Grant River, you see that there were six muscles observed last in 2003. So instead of trying to learn 50 species of freshwater mussels that occur in Wisconsin, you can start with six. And as mentioned, we have uh, various other resources, including videos on how to search and report mussels. Um, we have event calendars when it's a non-COVID year. We have news, including our um, newsletter. And we have contact information. So other resources, including that uh, expands from our website, are there are various apps you can use. We have field guides that we distribute to our, our volunteers. And the other one I want to touch on is iNaturalist, which is a, a social networking platform um, that encompasses millions of naturalists throughout the world. Um, it was developed by UC Berkeley um, and National Geographic in partnership. And that has allowed people to observe almost 60 million um, observations through citizen science to protect not only mussels, but say if you're interested in birds, it's kind of like eBird um, or plants, you want, want to learn what plant you're um, looking at. All you have to do is create and join and submit. Uh, muscle observations. So I'm just going to do a quick, quick run through on what it looks like on a smartphone. Uh, iNaturalist can be used without service. So even if you're on airplane mode or you have no service in northern Wisconsin, you can still upload records um, and it won't be an issue. So here's the screen. If you want to submit a new observation, all you hit on the bottom right is a plus button. That means you got to capture a photo and then it will geolocate, geotag your location on your phone if you have that active. And so you don't have to know where you, uh, you know, reported a muscle occurrence. Then it will try and identify what the photo you just took was based on uh, some fancy computer algorithm. Um, but say this photo of a three ridge, it, came, it got down to the genus, but then I would just select three ridge. Or you can leave it because it's a social media platform. So um, through crowds, crowdsourcing, including myself, um, will help identify it for you. And then there's a couple questions related to the muscle monitoring program itself, uh, just the water body and county that you found it in. So the program has two main monitoring strategies. One is ca casual observation. And that's just, say, if you and your family want to go out kayaking or paddling on a river, um, and then you're eating lunch on a beach and you come across a mus muscle shell, uh, you just report what you just saw. And we'll house that in our database. And it will still give you species presence at a particular location. Or you can expand it to time searches, which then uh, helps us establish species presence absence, uh, determine species lists or established lists, abundance, um, and even species richness estimates at a given site. So um, here are some monitoring tips, uh, where to look, what kind of methods are. But I just want to note before I hand it off here is how to sign up or if you're interested in muscle monitoring, um, just contact myself or Lisi. Uh, and before you call or email, just identify a location of interest. So it could be, you know, uh, a bridge crossing. It could be um, a county. It could be a watershed or it could be a lake. Uh, just have that in mind. Determine what monitoring strategy you want um, to include, whether it be casual observation or time searches. And then you, we'll discuss uh, logistics from there. And I just want to leave you with an interesting quote. So 
muscle heads, as we like to be called, is a very small group of people. So if we want to have a greater effect on environmental and societal issues that threaten the health and resi resiliency of aquatic um, ecosystems, an awareness and conservation support for mussels needs to reach those outside our small muscle head group. Um, so that's, that's our major objective is to increase awareness on this valuable resource um, and share it with the public. So um, to expand on that, uh, well, before we do, we're gonna get more uh, kazoos in. Uh, so I'll hand it back to James. Okay. Before we get started with that, I've got a quick question um, that came into the Q&A. So maybe Jesse, if you could stop sharing your screen while James gets the um, Kahoot set up. Sure. The question that came in was, I'm going to be doing some um, Asian clam surveys this summer in Waukesha County. We do a set number of transects, not an amount of time. So would this be a casual observation if we find native mussels? You could, or we, or we could coordinate together. Um, so transects are we, what we would consider quantitative. Um, and generally for uh, CBM volunteers, our quantitative uh, work is fairly labor intensive. So we don't advertise it, but we do utilize transects and especially in Waukesha County, that's a very um, muscle rich county to do muscle monitoring on. Um, so we would categorize, categorize as quantitative work, but then we'd coordinate or work together to, if you did want to do muscle surveys that way. All right, thanks. That was all the questions for now. Okay, with that, the information is up again. Um, I'm just going to reiterate that if you want to join, you just need any device that can connect to the internet. Go to, to kahoot.it on any internet browser. Enter the game pin 5235076. It will be asking you for it immediately. Enter the name you want to show up. And then when the questions come up, answer them on your device. Don't try to click on the presentation answers to use them. And with that, we shall continue. And Nyad is still in the lead. So, oh, hold, hold on. Looks like my screen stopped sharing for some reason. There we go. Can you guys see the Kahoot now? Yes. OK. Yep. Uh, so name this muscle. It's a little fast, but you only have five seconds left because I can't pause the timer. I love technology. All right. Yep, that one's a black sand shell. And fun fact about black sand shells, there's also a white sand shell. So don't get those too confused. I'm sure it's a little bit harder to get those confused. While you're answering this one, so the way most of these mussels got their name and clams was from clamors. And they would most of the time just base it off of what they thought it looked like. And that's how they got these really weird names in some cases. Okie doke. And Fawn's foot, good. Most people got it right. That's good. Well, about half got it right, I guess, technically. All right. And the third part of our break in between these two sections, name this muscle. Yeah, tough choices here, I know. Uh-huh. Nine answers, 10 answers in. All right, we'll keep getting more people. That's fantastic. 11 answers in, that's awesome. And eight of you guys got it correct. But you, as you can see, it's kind of hard to answer some of these. Some of these names are confusing. With that, we see that Muscle Man has jumped back into the lead with an answer streak of three. And we are now going to have Jared share about muscle engagement activities he is leading in his role at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. There we go. Go, all right, can everybody hear me? Yep. Fantastic. So we're gonna start slideshow. I'm gonna have to go to my display settings. I'm narrating what I'm doing right now, just a heads up. 
And we are good to go. All right. So as James had mentioned, my name is Jared McGovern with the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. I am not in Wisconsin. I'm in Iowa. So incredible outstanding winners about it. If you didn't know that's that's what Iowa stands for. It's, a, it's an acronym. Um, anywho. So what I do at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium is really exciting because my uh, my work doesn't really stop at, at a state border and neither does the work of those who were discussing a lot of the work they were doing earlier because Wisconsin's water is going to ultimately flow into the Mississippi River or into the Great Lakes and then it'll get into the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of Mexico eventually. And this photo uh, right here that you're looking at is not Iowa. It, is not Wisconsin, but it is within the Mississippi River's watershed. That's Estes Park, Colorado, right in here where the Continental Divide is. And I just love using this photo of my little family and this little man because that's kind of the reason that I, I'm really excited and motivated to continue doing this work is because now I got a future little steward uh, to raise of my own. Now, when, when I was discussing how the work of the River Museum and Aquarium is, is national and international, uh, the reason for that is because of the networks that we are members of. We are a member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which is about 200 members strong of nonprofit, city owned and state run, uh, as well as federal government run zoos or aquaria, which welcome well over 200,000. Uh, we welcome over 200,000 people. Collectively, the 200 institutions welcome over 200 million people on an annual basis. So we have a platform in which to scream at the mountaintops about the importance of animals such as freshwater mussels. Uh, one such program that is meant to align a lot of these efforts nationwide, uh, but also then to reach out to our research university and state, federal, county conservation partners is a program known as SAFE. And you'll see that up on the screen as well. And that stands for Saving Animals from Extinction and, uh, and I want to reference Jesse's point about uh, muscle heads that he made earlier. I was on a call with a bunch of muscle heads earlier. We are collaborating currently on putting forth a proposal to add freshwater mussels as a safe species. And one of the muscle heads was playing around on his uh, Photoshop and happened to make a North American muscle head safe. Uh, logo that was Arnold Schwarzenegger with two muscles right where the biceps go. So I thought that was fantastic. Uh, they also have a sense of humor in case you were wondering. Conservationists are definitely an interesting crew of their own. So uh, at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium, let's, let's kind of try this back to us here in Dubuque, Iowa. We approach conservation programming, especially conservation programming in kind of the upper Mississippi River Basin where we're in Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri from a, a human-centric point of view. When we take on uh, a conservation program in which we would like to collaborate on or assist in facilitating, it has to have a human-centric component. There must be an engagement or a public advocacy or a way to facilitate research with local partners. And the identity that we are developing uh, in that effort is known as Take Care. And so at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium, we ask people to take conservation action through community advocacy. We ourselves are starting to dip our toes into political advocacy and supporting different policies around climate resiliency, uh, nature-based solutions, um, as well as freshwater and ocean uh, restoration and, and uh, protection policies. Research, most of our research work currently is uh, all in the facilitation realm. You know, we, we are, we see ourselves as conveners, as connectors. And again, we're not really doing a ton of our own independent research. We are collaborating with area universities, with area partners, uh, city, county, state, uh, UW Platteville, University of Dubuque, lots of different partners in order for that work to move forward. And in the future, that will be more of an applied model where a team group will identify a problem and then devise a solution. And then engagement. This is the fun part. This is what you're about to see throughout the remainder of this presentation is the engagement side of things. About five years ago, we looked at what we were doing at the River Museum. Uh, and what we were doing was raising and head starting freshwater mussels and culture cages on our lower dock right on the Ice Harbor, connected directly to the Mississippi River in partnership with the Iowa DNR and the Genoa National Fish Hatchery up in uh, Genoa, Wisconsin. But that was it. Uh, you know, We were only able to engage people really 
twice a year when they put the animals in in May and we took the animals out in October. So what did we do? Subsea bucket days. So subseas are known as it's a it's an acronym that stands for submersible upwelling system and it's a system that was designed by uh, biologists in Alabama and ours are suspended from our dock and suspended from our dock we are head starting juvenile mussels for release back into the wild and what you're going to see in this video is a a short introduction to what we are doing here in the city of Dubuque and now I warn you there may be uh, some volume problems, so closed captioning is on. Natural muscle harvesting is Enjoy. viable. Combined with modern farming practices and increased development, raising the silt levels of Iowa rivers, mussels were pushed to the brink of extinction. Thankfully, just as regulations were enacted, conservation and education jumped to the mussels' aid as well. So we're here at the Dubuque Ice Harbor with the Mississippi River Museum, and uh, we're harvesting our cages of infested fish Black sand chill. to bring in the mussels that dropped off of them over the season. Um, so these mussels will be used for recovery of um, rivers as far north as the Chippewa River in Wisconsin, and then as far south as uh, around Guttenberg in Iowa. A harvesting crew of biologists DNR employees and volunteers are collecting thousands of juvenile Higgins eye pearly mussels, an endangered mussel found throughout the Midwest. This recovery effort is an excellent example of the interconnected nature of mussels and the aquatic ecosystem they help maintain. Higgins eye are a group, part of a group of mussels that lure in their host fish. And the females have uh, a part of their, their mantle, which is the part of the animal that builds their shell, that um, is modified to look like a fish. And in the turbid water, apparently fish, you know, their vision declines just like ours does. And so they have kind of a basic lure. Um, it's got like a frilly tail and a little bit of an eye spot. And the mussel is able to push her gills up where her larvae are stored and the fish will come down, sees that, thinks it's lunch, it comes down and takes a bite. And in doing that, it breaks open the female mussel's gills and gets infested with the larvae of the mussel then. Over the coming weeks, the larvae will transform into juvenile mussels and fall off their fish hose to the river bottom. If they settle into a suitable habitat, a new mussel bed will propagate. These animals don't have eyes. They have photoreceptive cells that can tell if it's light or dark. Itty bitty bundle of nerves that is- uh, Just a heads up, this was in 2019. So pre-2020, pre-masks. Oh, I should have thrown that out there. An educator at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. And events like the Higgins Eye Harvest are the perfect experience for students to learn all of the wonders of these seemingly insignificant mollusks. So these guys and gals right here, you are now a freshwater mussel. On top of seeing the harvest up close and personal, the Buke area students learn all about the mussels Iowa history, their life cycle, species identification practices, and of course, a first hand. Let's get back to that. Well, I can tell if it's light or dark. Sorry about that. Design harvest are the perfect experience for students to learn all of the wonders of these seemingly insignificant mollusks. So these guys and gals right here, you, are now a freshwater mussel. On top of seeing the harvest up close and personal, the Buke area students learn all about the mussels' Iowa history, their life cycle, species identification practices, and of course, a firsthand look at their water filtration powers. I put these animals in here, eight o'clock. It's now close to nine o'clock. And in that time, those animals have filtered about two and a half gallons of water. Hands-on field trips like Jared's have the potential to change a student's life. Holding a muscle and learning how humans, wildlife, and the ecosystem depend on it is the kind of experience that builds conservationists. But if not, they at least learn that the quality of their environment can hinge on something as small as a freshwater mussel. These are a keystone species. They literally create a habitat with their body. These animals, as they grow, they are in such mass, in such volume in certain areas that they will cover the entire bottom of the Mississippi River. And they're going to 
create a physical structure for algae to grow on, algae which then attracts insects, insects that attract fish, some fish even breed on these mussel beds. So as a keystone species, if it was not for this particular animal, that habitat would not exist. These animals are one of the coolest and one of the most important critters living in the Mississippi River. And in North America, we have the most diverse population of anywhere else in the world. So when I reference uh, North America in that one, when I, when I shot that video, I was referencing just the US and Canada, but it was pointed out to me actually just today that there could uh, potentially be an additional 50 species that are endemic to Mexico. So in North America, we're looking at close to 350 species of freshwater mussels in which Jesse had referenced around 70% of them are considered imperiled. That is insane. That should blow your mind and that should drive some serious urgency in changing the way that we manage our watersheds for these particular animals, not just because of how cool they are, but because of the services that they provide in creating clean water resources that we recreate on and that we enjoy uh, drinking, right? Now, uh, we also kind of dipped our toe into something a little bit different this year. And we are working right now in the Bee Branch Creek. And the Bee Branch Creek is a uh, entirely urban watershed here in the city of Dubuque in which we are doing a habitat suitability study on using mussel silos. And once again, engaging the community, engaging the public in mussel conservation and uh, nature-based solutions to uh, climate change and extreme weather events. Golf ball here. Conlon Construction, builders since 1903. They're one of our sponsors, just a heads up. Jared, I'm here to see what conservation projects you're working on down at the B branch. Awesome, welcome. We, <laughs> this is great, you love this. We are flexing our muscles. We're flexing our muscles with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and of course, the city of Dubuque, because we are in the Bee Branch Greenway. The Bee Branch Greenway is about a mile long stretch of river that had been buried for about 100 years. And because when the city leadership and designers built this flood mitigation project, they included areas for wildlife to reestablish. They focused on wildlife habitat just as much as they did flood mitigation. So what we've been doing down here this year is we have been working. Ah, it keeps doing that. Sorry about that, guys. Did it again. There we go. V forward. There we go. Included areas for wildlife to reestablish. They focused on wildlife habitat just as much as they did flood mitigation. So what we've been doing down here this year is we have been working with restoring freshwater mussel populations into this stretch of the bee branch, but also performing a habitat suitability study. So we're trying to see just how well mussels could thrive in this habitat before connectivity is restored between the Mississippi River and this mile stretch of creek. We have a lot of really great answers from this summer, but we also have a lot more questions. And so we're hoping to continue this project over the next couple of years to see what reestablishes naturally through fish migration, but also to continue with the public engagement component with the mussels that we have released, as well as our mussel silos. Hi, Corinne. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How is this experience going for your students? Oh, it's wonderful. I love being able to have them out in the field, have some real world experience, some hands-on experience. But then I think the other really important part is the, the stewardship piece that the River Museum really offers to see what role can they play in improving the quality of our community. You know, I got to get going. I can't be late. So if you were, um, if you're wondering, the animals that we're working with are fat mucket, not husky mucket, as James had come up with another fun common name for them. Uh, but in that, in that stretch of stream, the questions that have come up over the last couple of uh, months, which is really interesting, that which led to an extended research project with a local university, was the chloride concentrations. And so we, we actually had a fairly high or, or consistent chloride measurement during the summer months, which was weird to us, considering that most of the water that was feeding this creek during the summer was of uh, groundwater discharge. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of surface runoff because we had a really dry summer. 
So we continued the chloride measurements over the winter, and there's been some really interesting data coming. And it was University of Dubuque undergrad environmental science students who took on that particular project, which has been really, really exciting to be kind of the catalyst for some of this other work that's being carried out throughout uh, the community. So what's next? Teens take care. Teens take conservation action through advocacy, research, and community engagement. Uh, that photo to the left, that I'm in that photo from 2003, that lanky kid in the red shirt there with his hands in his pocket and a film camera around his neck. This was a trip that I went on with Iowa State University when I was a junior in high school. This was the trip that I can trace back to where my career in conservation, environmental education, and, uh, and natural resources began. It was meant to inspire future science educators, and in my case, it worked. We are not going to recreate this experience. We are creating something different, something that rather than being designed by researchers and university professionals, it's something that is designed by the teens themselves. So the Teens Take Care program, which we are going to be hosting our first focus groups in towards the end of April here, are going to be uh, looking to build a program for teens by teens in which the River Museum takes on more of a facilitation role, helping for these teens' voices to be heard. One of the teens in this picture who's been working with us over the last three years, she is going to Co College in Cedar Rapids on a full scholarship and majoring in sustainability and sustainable sciences. That's amazing. That's the kind of impact that we want to have at the River Museum. And for her, it started with muscles. <laughs> That's cool. Now, before we transition back to James, I have one last video and I promise you I'm not accidentally gonna click on the screen and hit pause this time around. Uh, and this is just to, once again, remind you how awesome freshwater mussels are if you don't already think that way, which you should, and they are. Oh no. those mussels. That said, they may be one of Iowa's most important animals. That saying is true for Wisconsin as well. My name is Jared McGovern with the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. My contact info is here on the page. And uh, hey, get outside and have some fun in the water this summer, huh? Thanks, Jared. And going back over here, once again, the name that muscle game is still going on. Here's the information. Remember to pull up another device or another screen. Go to kahoot.it if you haven't already gone there. Type in the code 5235076, enter a name, and join us because we're having fun. That's not it. So continuing with Muscle Man being in the lead. So name this muscle. Now, this one is named, as I told you before, after what it looks like. So what do you think that it looks like? All right. Some people thought it looked like a square pig toe. Some people thought it looked like a deer toe. Sounds good. And with that, Cody pulls into the lead. 
All right. Name this muscle. This one's a pretty fun one. As you can see, all of the fun options for names. And yes, I promise one of them is correct. So let's see which one of those you think it looks like. All right, two people thought it looked like a jerk face, but the other seven thought it looked like a monkey face. So with that, Jared pulls up. Cody's still in the lead, but Jared's catching him quite quickly. All right, name this muscle. Which one of these four is it? You now have 11 seconds. Be snappy with your answers. Make sure you're correct. Flex your muscle. There you go. And by that, I mean your brain. All right. Grumpy, three people thought it was one of the seven dwarves. Okay. And seven thought it was the mucket. And with that, nothing changes. <laughs> All right. At this point, we're going to have Becky now give you a brief overview of how we've become involved at, at U the University of Wisconsin Platteville. All right. Can everybody see my slide? Looking good? Yep. Okay, so um, I just want to spend a little bit of time here kind of wrapping this up and talking about how we got involved in this collaboration with the people you've heard already today um, and how we're getting our university involved in muscle conservation. Um, and before I get, get into this, I do want to acknowledge our funding sources. Many of you may have heard Marissa talking today at lunch about the Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin. Um, we were able to get funding from them uh, to support two of my students and some of the work we did this summer. And then, of course, University of Wisconsin Platteville has also funded some of our work as well. All right. The reality of science uh, is that it's typically not this straight path um, going from one from one project to another, right? Uh, it's usually this very convoluted path that takes us through many different discoveries and many different uh, collaborators and projects along the way. Um, typically, my students look like the student that you see on the far left-hand side of the stream. We're out in the middle of a lake. We're throwing nets into the water and pulling the stuff up that's swimming around in the water column. However, thanks to some really great people and great connections. Um, this past summer, my students looked a lot more like Cody does on this right hand side, um, snorkeling around in the local rivers, checking out uh, the substrates, looking for mussels. Uh, and so I want to talk just a little bit about this. Uh, I started out my career in the state down here in Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. And when I first got there, I met this guy who you just, just heard uh, speaking, Jared. Uh, Jared was at University of Platteville with me for a couple of years, I believe, um, but then quickly uh, transitioned to his new position at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. The two of us have kept in touch, however, uh, and have had a great time uh, talking about collaborations. And in particular, every time we've been talking about the collaborations we had going, which had nothing to do with muscles, he would bring up the muscles <laughs> every single time trying to get me uh, to get on board as I am an invert zoologist. Uh, and I just haven't had the time to really dig into it. Uh, my area of expertise is pretty far away from muscles. Um, but then uh, last spring, spring of 2020, uh, I had a sabbatical um, and had plans actually to go to Australia and work with a muscle biologist there. And I'd started to make some connections here, thinking I would start to really delve into muscle biology. But of course, you all know the story. Uh, this is what happened. <laughs> um, and so I didn't make it overseas. Instead, I stayed in Wisconsin uh, and had what was really great. Um, a bunch of time, right, to focus, <laughs> which I don't get a lot of as a faculty member. Uh, and so I did a lot of writing and had my students do a lot of writing. And we were very lucky. Whoops, sorry. 
very lucky to get some funding to to support a really full summer of research and so here's Cody uh, he and James both applied for this great program we have at UW Platteville called the summer undergraduate undergraduate scholars program where students get to delve into an area that they want to spend time thinking about for the whole summer uh, and he um, Cody was very lucky to get one of these grants uh, and James was really close <laughs> um, and so I was really hoping to also be able to get him a team funded uh, and so I uh, decided to apply for a grant at Platteville. I had to share this. I think somebody in the audience will appreciate. Um, this is a colleague of mine, Chris, who's the rivers person at UW Platteville. I'm the lake person. Uh, but he gave my son a onesie that says limnologists are people too. At that point, I knew at some point we had to collaborate. And so we wrote a grant together to do some muscle and fish work. And then I also have a colleague um, who I went to undergrad and grad school with, um, who just took over the directorship at Trout Lake Field Station up in, nor in Northern Wisconsin. The two of us heard about this Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin, decided to throw in a grant uh, to do some undergraduate research, and we're, we're very lucky to get funded. And so I was able to fund both James and Emma off of that. And thanks to COVID uh, slowing our progress down a little bit, we are actually still going to have some funding for the next summer to continue some of this work. Uh, in the process of writing all of these grants, uh, we got got connected um, and did some reading, found out that Jesse and Lissy had been doing some amazing work around the state, uh, looked into what they had done, and it looked like there was a little piece of the puzzle that we might be able to help fill. Uh, and so we decided um, to take their big picture of doing this muscle work across the state uh, and use it to predict what we thought might be happening in Southwest Wisconsin, where, as Jesse pointed out before, there haven't actually been muscle surveys since 2003. And so, um, we had lots of plans to collaborate with Jesse and Lizzie. Um, unfortunately, uh, COVID kept us virtual. Um, so this summer, we're going to hopefully get out in the field with them. Um, but they were able to help us from afar, uh, even though, like I said, we were starting with no expertise on this. Um, but we also were able to get Jared out in the field with us a bit as well. Um, but we spent the summer exploring. Um, and so we got everybody in the water. Uh, we even got my kids in the water. They didn't get to snorkel in Australia, but they got to snorkel in high hazel green. So Oh, really, uh, <laughs> in the Mississippi, it uh, doesn't get much better, right? Uh, so we made our way out into the field. Um, this was our project for this past summer. We decided to look at baseline study, um, a baseline study of the abundances and diversities of mussels in southwest Wisconsin. Um, we had seen on websites that there are roughly 30 mussel species that had been identified in this part of the state. That's including uh, those that are found in the Mississippi River. As Jesse pointed out and showed you earlier, uh, there are about six that were found in the rivers found in this state uh, about 20 years ago. The research that Jesse and Lizzie had done. Um, had shown that the northernmost sites were, were doing better in comparison to what had, had been done in the past, but some of the southernmost sites weren't doing as well. And so we predicted um, that maybe uh, they might not be thriving in southwest Wisconsin if they were looking anything like the sites that they had sampled in southeastern Wisconsin. And so we went out with kind of a sad hypothesis <laughs> about what we'd find. Um, Unfortunately, uh, we didn't find a lot of mussels, um, but we did find some interesting things. So we sampled the little plat and many of its tributaries. Uh, we um, <laughs> had a very fast flowing and turbid summer, um, lots of rain more than usual, I think, uh, for our summers. So that made things a little challenging, but we still got in there. We had some really interesting sites where we got to climb over pool ladders to get <laughs> into our sites. You know it's an official site when you have a pool ladder that's permanently affixed that you get to climb over. Um, and when you have bulls that are watching you snorkel in the river, that, that made for a <laughs> fun sight um, to, to check out. But we didn't find any mussels in the Little Platte or any of their tributaries this time. We did, however, find the Asian clams uh, that many of you identified on James's quiz. Again, not mussels, uh, but an invasive species. That was a good find. Um, they hadn't been recorded yet in our site. And so while we're not happy they're there, we are happy that we did find them um, and were able to record their, their presence. Uh, the Grant River, uh, we were able to sample multiple sites. This river was a bit more clear, a bit more deep, um, provided some fun, <laughs> some, some fun floating for us um, in our wetsuits. 
we did find a lot of shells. Uh, I was running a bit behind to get to the site and had both of my students texting me furiously one morning as I was getting there, um, telling us that they had found shells. We found shells. Um, and so <laughs> we were super excited thought for sure we were going to find a bed um, we did not find a live bed but the fact that there were shelves there um, suggests, and, and some that looked like they hadn't been dead for too long um, suggest there might be a bed there we just haven't found it so we're hoping this summer to get back out and um, be able to explore a little bit more so no live mussels in our river sites um, but uh, Jared <laughs> after I was telling him how we were having a hard time finding anything alive was kind enough to take us to a site uh, that was close to Dubuque between us and Dubuque it's called Sunfish Lake and it's a recently restored wetland area right off of the Mississippi uh, he had said that he had been kayaking there and just noticed shells we had talked to the managers they said it had been restored for fish and fowl likely not going to be a good habitat for mussels um, and mussels hadn't been recorded there so we went and checked it out um, and fortunately we did find some mussels um, and I was able to get my whole freshwater class out there um, for a few days to, to do a survey of the site and to get a sense for whether or not we're finding mussels kind of throughout the site or where they're located. Uh, and so this video will just give you kind of a, a, an aerial sense of some of the, this, this site, right? And so the Mississippi is over here on the left. Um, and you can see my students kayaking um, down below. You can see Emma, James, and... <laughs> and Cody, you can barely see them right in the center snorkeling. Um, and then you'll see this will pan over. And so what we found is right where Emma, Cody and James are snorkeling, we found a really healthy bed of mussels. So that was very exciting. Um, oh, it looks like it's, there we go. And as this pans over, we're actually going to find the mussel bed that we found with Jared this summer, um, which wasn't as healthy of a bed. There are a lot of dead shells there, um, some live, um, but a lot of older shells as well. And we were finding younger shells in this newer, newer bed. So we're pretty excited about the site, looking forward to some future collaborations or future work on this site. Um, let me skip this ahead. And so there is actually um, where you can see all these other students. There's a channel right here, and that's where the older bed was found. So beautiful site. If you haven't been to Sunfish Lake down near Hazel Green, it's a really great, really great location. So we're going to continue that work. I have two students who've written grants to do work on that system this summer. And this will show you what we actually did find. Um, this is the healthy bed and I'll try to show you um, so you can see right in the center there, you can see a muscle. It's got both of its, well, it had both of its valves open until I got too close. I apologize. I'm, I'm new to the GoPro, so it's a little, <laughs> a little shaky here. And there you can see another one right in the middle of the screen with both of its valves open, both of its siphons. There are a couple more. So this site was great. It was nice and clear. You'll notice the water is super clear. Um, that's not the case throughout this site. And so these mussels are doing their job. Huge diversity of macrophytes there too, which is fun as I was getting excited and distracted by. <laughs> um, so lots of fun mussels in these sites. Uh, a great place to take my students so that they can see these mussels in their native habitat. So we're looking forward to the opportunity to spend some more time. We weren't able to get the permitting that we needed right away to actually get down and see who's there. So we were only doing snor snorkeling surveys from the surface, um, but we're looking forward to seeing who's there. There is a chance that we do have a threatened species at this site, given that they are found just upstream of this particular site. So, um, what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, um, just to give you the a picture from the original site, you can see on the left, this is what the, um, the side that the um, bed that was off to the side that doesn't look as healthy was looking like. You can see a lot of mussels that are open. Um, and so a number of dead mussels in that area. All right, so overall, um, the way that we are trying to contribute to this opportunity to kind of expand the scientific knowledge, but also expand the opportunities to get people 
become, you know, help people become aware um, is, first of all, we're giving a lot of trying to offer a number of hands on real world um, student research experiences. <laughs> I'm seeing my students texting on the phone saying they're wishing they could come back this summer. Um, we had a great summer working together. Uh, and so we did have a lot of fun um, doing some summer research. Um, in addition, as I said, we've got a number of students that are getting some great hands on grant and proposal writing experience as well as paper writing experience, which my students will be doing pretty soon. They're really excited about it, I'm sure. Um, we were able to get my courses out into the field. I've got three different courses that I'm hoping to take out and get this experience. Um, seeing these muscles hand, hands on, the great thing about the, the beds in this particular site is that you can go out in waders. Um, and so we can get everybody out there, which is great. Uh, lots of opportunities for collaboration and, co and collect or connectivity. Um, one of the things that I like about working in small groups, uh, they, <laughs> Jared mentioned earlier that the, the muscle heads are not this massive group, or maybe it was Jesse. Um, and it, in some respects, I think that's awesome because people in these smaller groups are always so willing to help out, so generous with their time. Um, and that's really helpful for those of us who want to get involved. Uh, and so this has been a great opportunity for my students to get to interact with these with these different people. Um, and finally, outreach and presentation opportunities like the one that we have today. Um, as you saw, my students were able to present this really great basic muscle biology, which is an awesome experience for them, but also hopefully helped to let the rest of you know a little bit more about this great group of organisms. Uh, and so for the future of this project, we, um, you know, we've, we've just started <laughs> and COVID kind of kept us at a slower start, um, but we are planning more research and continued collaborations. Um, we are hoping to add the Pecatonica and move a little bit further east, or sorry, yeah, further east of our sites. Um, one of my colleagues at Platteville found a mussel while doing frog work in the Pecatonica, not where I would have expected to find mussels, so we're hoping to go check that out. Uh, again, more work on Sunfish Lake in addition to continuing our work on the sites that we worked on last summer. Um, and then we're going to get up to Trout Lake Field Station and do some comparative analyses of what we're finding down here versus what we're finding up in these northern lake regions. Um, we're planning on ramping up the outreach as soon as COVID lets us, um, trying to get some creative online stuff going this semester yet. I do um, advise a group called the Animal House that gets a lot of opportunities um, to outreach going uh, for our students and are, I'm hoping to get muscles involved in that group. I also have a number of courses that have a required component of doing a research project that involves some outreach. And so I've got a couple of students on this Zoom right now that will be helping me with that and hopefully doing some muscle related work. And then hopefully once we can travel again, I've got flights still hovering in the air somewhere, um, we'll make it back over to Australia and start an international research collaboration with um, this guy right here and his colleagues at Perth. Um, Australia only has two officially identified threatened species, and he thinks that that's definitely a low, low ball estimate. Uh, and so we're going to try to get a good um, interaction going, get students over there, get their students over here, and get a nice um, research-based, a, a broad experience built for our students. And so with that, um, we're going to take questions with our last 13 minutes here. <laughs> I've been watching the clock. Um, we also have a few more Kahoot questions for you. And so if you haven't already registered for the Kahoot, you can go to Kahoot.it. You can log in with this this code 5235076. Um, and we'll get into some more questions with James. And while he is going through those questions, if you could get your questions for us in the Q&A section, then we'll open the floor and start answering questions as the Kahoot wraps up. All right, and here's my contact information on the bottom. All right, thanks, Becky. So once again, the Kahoot quiz um, we're going to play Name That Muscle again. We're going to keep going. We're almost done. Uh, game code is 523-5076 at kahoot.it. Enter a name you want to play with if, you haven't, if you're not already in. And let's get into it. So when we last left off, Cody was in the lead, but Jared was quickly approaching. <laughs> so name this Muscle. This is a pretty cool looking one. Do, 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 do. I don't have any music for you, really. So 
You'll just have to envision it in your head. Okay, and we had five guessed Pimpleback correctly. And Green Stripe, which I was hoping, that got a couple of votes too. So let's see. Cody is still in the lead, but Emma's starting to come up. All right, name this muscle. <laughs> can you guess what the theme is for this muscle's identification? <laughs> I bet you can. Five answers in. How many more are we going to get? Six. Anybody else? One more. Seven. Yes. Okay, we got at least seven answers. Six of you got it right. Good. We talked about this one. I was hoping that you... I was hoping we talked about this one. All right. And with that, Muscle Man drops a little bit and Kingfisher comes pulling up. So we're having a pretty close fight in the top three for sure. All right. Name this one. This one. I'll give you a hint. It's a pocketbook. Get it? Get it? It's a pocketbook because all of the answers have pocketbooks. Uh-huh. Two. Oh, we have eight people answering now. That's fantastic. All right. Six of you guessed Rock Pocket Book correctly. And the other two, Sand Pocket Book and Hidden Pocket Book, that's okay. Those were pretty, pretty regular op options. All right. And with that, Stream Girl is coming up into the top five. Okay. All right. Now, this one here. Name this one. Again. Remember, these were named after what the clamors thought that they looked like. So did they think it looked like a round elephant toe, a brown goat horn, a round pig toe, or a small crow beak? Now, eight of you answered last time, so I expect there to be at least eight answers this time. Oh, only oh, there were eight. Last second. Somebody's cutting it close. Six of you got it right. All right. And Streamer Girl, Stream Girl has the highest answer streak that's good but nothing else has changed all right 17 of 20 name this one is it a spike is it a poke is it a dull or is it a flat and i have a fun fact i'll share with you about this one once the real the correct answer has been shown spike is correct because it resembles a railroad spike that you hammer into the ground that the train goes chug chug over top of. Cody's still in the lead, but Jared is is slowly closing that gap. All right, 18 of 20. We're almost there. Name this one. Is it a Greenland goat's foot, a wabash pig toe, a Scottish sheep's hoof, or a Kenyan elephant's heel? Your guess is as good as mine, because mine's not a guess. Wabash Pigto, that is correct. Greenland's goat foot. I was pretty it's pretty close though. You were right next to the right answer. All right. Cody's still in the lead. Jared might looks like he's falling behind a little bit, but Jared has a highest answer streak of 14 right now. Correct. All right, 19 of 20. We're down to the last two. Name this muscle. What is it? A hunchback, a bumpy back, a lumpy back, or a warty back? I'll give you a hint. It has back in the name. <laughs> Five answers. Come on. We got to get back up to eight. Six. Come on. Six. Seven. Eight answers. Yes. And almost everybody got it correct with warty back. Nice job, everyone. Oh, Emma pulls ahead of Jared just by 17 points. Oof. Got to answer fast, Jared. Got to answer fast. Now, name this one. This is the last question. Is it a ringer, a flatboard, a washboard, or a shell? Do-do-do. Do-do-do. Seven answers. It's the washboard. All right. Nobody guessed shell. I'm surprised. All right. <laughs> we have our winners. Cody is number three. Wow, what a change. Jared is number two. 
And Emma comes from behind and takes the win. Wow. Woo, woo, woo. Just a shout out to Stream Girl and Muscle Man for being fourth and fifth. <laughs> All right. With that, we're going to go and answer any questions that have come in since playing. All right. Well, thanks for that fun and informative session, everyone. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you here. So, um, and also congratulations to Emma. Um, I was stream girl. So I almost started to sneak up on you, but I didn't quite get there. All right. So for someone who is just getting started in their interests of muscles, um, what um, identification guides or resources, where would you point someone who's just starting to learn and wants to know what they're seeing out there in the field so they know the answers to some of those quiz questions? I, I would direct us or that person to the Wisconsin Muscle Monitoring website. Um, as mentioned, it just provides that foundation for anything related to muscles in Wisconsin. Um, you can use that little GIS tool to select what county you either live in or that you're interested in, and then select the river or a local river that has had muscle observations occur. Um, so then you could learn those couple species that have already been documented in your stream. All right, thanks. I'll, I'll wait and see. Does anyone else on the panel have anything else they'd like to add to that great recommendation? No, I'm, oh. I'm also a fan of paper-based copies of things. And one of my favorite is uh, usually available through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge is Freshwater Mussels of the Upper Mississippi River. Yep. And it's, I mean, this is the second edition. The third edition is a lot better. And uh, it, it's a fun pocket guide to have with you. But like Jesse had said, you know, there's maybe 30 to 40 species listed in this book. You're not going to find 30 to 40 species in every water body throughout Wisconsin. So it's, yeah. Yeah, I think you end up in the streams collecting or even in the lakes. You'll find maybe um, uh, a half dozen to a dozen species and you can get familiar with those species. And I find that if people take pictures and they put it on iNaturalist or they just look at the shells and take the pictures and then they send them in, um, we can say, they think they, they say, I think I have a this, this and a that. And you say, oh, you actually have a this, that and a that. And then you can explain what they're seeing. You can see, you can explain the nuances and they learn their muscles amazingly within a year or two. People are learning their muscles. It's amazing. I can vouch my team used all three of those resources <laughs> and my guys learned them really well. So, and gals, so yes. Yeah. yeah, obviously they got first and third, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So getting at the, um, you know, the citizen science, science aspect and, and getting the public interested and youth interested in muscles, um, I'm interested in, and I've heard this question asked in other muscle forums before, since these creatures are protected and there's rules and permits and stuff involved. It makes it a little more complicated than maybe invert, you know, insects or plants. Mm -hmm. um, how do you manage that aspect of it where people get the chance to see these specimens and species, but aren't inadvertently maybe disturbing or harming them? I'll jump in on that one. Um, if they're live muscles, then you want to take them out. You want to look at them. And I say, don't like stick them back in the mud because you might get them upside down. So just lay them back down. But the shell material can be kept except on the St. Croix and Namakagan. So um, if you can keep that shell material, then you can go back and look at it and compare it and learn from them. Um, so, and also Jesse and I do trainings on the states uh, around the state. Um, so I think, you know, it's great to get the live mussels and observe those. Um, but you also, with a Ziploc, you can collect them and keep them. And I highly recommend rinsing them off before you put them in a Ziploc and let them sit in your car for hours. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, it's, a, it's easy to collect the shells um, with the extent of the St. Croix Namakagan nest because it's a park service. All right, great. And I'd be um, mindful too that each state has different regulation. Mm -hmm. so exactly. And Iowa have very different regulations when it comes to how you are uh, allowed to handle and work with freshwater mussels. And I'm sure it's the same with all border states around the area. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, absolutely. Well, um, we're at that time. So thank you all for a really excellent session. It was a lot of fun to sit in as your moderator. I know I learned a lot and uh, having that engagement, especially kind of mid afternoon to keep the energy levels up is, is a really good thing. So, so thank you all. Um, and for our audience, we are wrapping up this session. We're now entering a break until 3.30 p.m. And during this time, we encourage you to visit the exhibitors and participate in the Wisconsin Water Week challenges throughout Event Mobi, um, and conference sessions will begin again at 3.30. So thank you again for joining and enjoy the rest of Wisconsin Water Week. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.